Well, God bless you, saints, citizens, and soldiers of the Most High God. My name is Clarence, and I'm pastor of United Body of Christ Church, which is an online ministry. On behalf of my family and myself, we'd like to take this opportunity to welcome back your families, to welcome back yourselves, back to another broadcast, back to another Bible study. Uh, today we are coming at you with Joel chapter 2, Joel chapter 2, or Yoel chapter 2, <laughs> excuse me, uh, chapter 2 there, a uh, little tongue twisted there. Interesting chapter, we'll be, we'll be able to tie uh, so, some things that's talked about in this chapter here, we'll be able to tie that in uh, to the start of, somewhat of the start of Christianity, a promise that God had given here with uh, Joel, and it gets fulfilled, uh, you know, and, and we'll read about it in the books of Acts, in the book of Acts, so I don't want to put, you know, some of you may already be ahead of me, and you already know, spoiler alert, but we want to at least get a chance to dive into it, and to, and to read about it, and, and to see how it affects us today, amen, so I'm excited about that, amen, um, as always, before we begin, we like to go before the Lord in prayer. Our Father, thou art in heaven, and hallowed be thy name. Thine kingdom comes, thine will be done in earth, just as your will is done in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Your majesty, we ask that you would forgive us of our sins. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would forgive us of our transgressions. Father, we ask that you would forgive us of our debts. We ask that you would forgive us of our trespasses. As we forgive those that have trespassed against us. O oh Lord, lead us. Not into temptation, but deliver us from the hands of the evil one. Father, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from all evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, now and forevermore and it's in Jesus name his Hebrew name Yeshua Hamashiach it's in his name that we pray ancient of days the great I am the father of our Lord and Savior Jesus who is the Christ the God of Abraham of Isaac and of Jacob the friend of David. Father, we come before you. We're grateful for the mercies that has been extended that made it possible to come before you. We also find ourselves grateful for the path that was set, the only path that leads to you, that goes through your only begotten son, the Lord Jesus Christ. It is that path that we took to seek your face, to discover your ways, and to apply them. It's because of him. It's because of our king, the shepherd and the bishop of our souls. Because of him, we are able to kneel before you. Because of him, we are able to worship you in spirit and in truth. Because of him, we are fed daily. Because of him, we walk and we abide in victory. Because of him, righteousness has been attributed unto us. And because of him, we are your sons and your daughters. So Jesus, we thank you for so many things that you have done and continue to do on our behalf. For allowing us to be part of the family for welcoming us into the kingdom and allowing the kingdom to abide inside of us. Lord God Almighty, strong and true, 
awesome in all your ways and your wonders. The only wise, true, living God. Thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity to draw near, to be edified spiritually, to receive the seed of the word, of the word and that our swords would be sharpened. Thank you for this, O oh Lord, that you would allow us a seat at the table to commune and to break bread with you and to fellowship with you and one with another. Thank you, Father, for the love that you've bestowed upon us individually and collectively. Thank you for looking towards our goings, our goings outs and our coming ins, our coming ins and our goings outs. Father, thank you for being mindful of us, your majesty. Have your way in this Bible study. Have your way in our understanding. Bestow upon us knowledge, revelation and understanding and insight, oh God, to help us to understand the word of God. Help us to entreat it, O oh God, into simple, in the simplest form, O oh God. And help us to devour the word that our spirits be nourished. God, I thank you for the opportunity to not only feast on the word, but to be a server of it, O oh God. All glory belongs to you because it's you who had called for it to be written, and it's you who have called for it to be distributed. Thank you for the means to do it, O oh God, and be glorified. I thank you for the opportunity to call you Father. I thank you for the faith to believe the word which we are about to receive. Be glorified in Jesus' name, and we pray. Amen. Folks, just briefly, i like to... Uh, give a shout out, not, not so much of a shout, but a plug in is what I mean to say about the expansion of our ministry. Uh, those of you who have Apple TV, those of you who have uh, Roku devices, you are able to download our app and watch our Bible studies from those devices now. Uh, you just simply type in United Body of Christ. Our app will come up and just install it uh, and you're able, you're able to watch our uh, Bible studies. Uh, also, those of you with Apple iPhones, you can download our app from, from the Apple Store. Those of you with Android devices as well, you can download our app uh, from, from the uh, Google Play Store, and you'll be able to enjoy our uh, Bible study content for you. Amen? Uh, it's as, at least on our uh, uh, Android and Apple phones there, you're able to access the app to be able to uh, send out prayer requests. You know, if you have a, a, a desire for, for prayer, um, feel free to, to uh, fill out the prayer forms there. Amen. So we're excited about the expansion of our, uh, of our ministry on the various platforms. Those of you that have uh, uh, Apple, uh, not Apple, but um, Amazon uh, uh, Kindle tablets, or, or just a tablet in general, you're able to download our app also from the uh, 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 Amazon uh, web store, the uh, app store there. Amen. So I wanted to make sure that we well, always try to take time out to let you know uh, what investments uh, we're making uh, with, with the help that we've been getting from you guys to let you see the expansion of the ministry the, in getting God's word out, doing our, our part, amen, to get that word out. So we're excited about that. Um, God is the chef. The bread that God has prepared for us to break and to receive, it's the word of God. It's the bread of life. He is the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is the bread. He is the word. He is our Lord and Savior. It's the Holy Spirit that dwells inside of you, that dwells inside of us, that have called us to come together throughout this recording, that we can come together and fellowship and break bread and, and receive the word of God. Amen. So it's the Holy Ghost that has given you that appetite and that has given us that unction, right, to come together. So that's our way. That's our ministry's way of honoring 
the chef, which is the father, the bread, which is the son, and he that sends the invite, the Holy Ghost. Amen. So that's our way of honoring them. I also take this opportunity to honor my wife. I love her. and She loves me. I bless God for all the days, the years, the moments that he has given us together to not only grow our relationship, but to grow in ministry and to be a help one to another. She's been helping me for these 20 years in God's calling on my life. Amen. And I take this time to acknowledge uh, God working through her to, to, to help me with those things that I need to be successful in my calling. So I bless God for giving me a daughter that's easy to love. His, his daughter, which is my wife, easy to love, and I'm grateful to have her. Amen. So to God be the glory for his kindness, not just on me, but on my family. Uh, without any further ado, we'll get right into it. This is Joel uh, chapter 2, verse 1. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in the holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. And remember, in our last recording, uh, there was an infestation, there was an invasion of locusts, and the evolution of their destruction, Joe talked about, the canker worm, the palmer worm, so on and so forth, right? So he was talking about the evolution of the destruction, how they decimated the community, their economy, everything was decimated, and Joel didn't look at it as just a freak of nature. He attributed, he attributed those events uh, um, to, to God himself. As he, he called the, in other words, he called the locusts an army and their chief was God. God sent, the, God sent his army in to desolate the land, to decimate the land. Because of, of the, the sins that were running rampant, the things that the people allowed, right? The, the, what you've allowed, what they've allowed, what we allow into our lives. Uh, and that we're, we're not trying to move out. We're not trying to change. We just make room for these things. And um, they got in the way of, of God's relationship with his people, the sins. And so... God sent his, he sent an army in there, an army of locusts to come in there and to, to devour and decimate, right? So, having that understanding, Joel is saying this, this is a five alarm fire, you know, uh, figuratively speaking, of course. It's a five alarm fire. This is, you know, emergency, emergency. We all need to, to come together. And, and we need to figure out what to do about this. We can't just let this happen and then just set back. We need to do something, you know, to, to make sure that this don't happen again. And their way of becoming proactive was not to let's rebuild and make it stronger. It was coming to terms to see how, they, how that had happened to them in the first place, right? A lot of times when uh, what we term in our modern day era is, natural disasters we're not looking to see exactly how how it really happened unto us we don't look at what the spiritual things that happen and then they manifest naturally man look at okay well this happened let me rebuild it's like a gesture of pride well you get me right now, but you're not going to get me later. I'm going to make, I'm going to build back even stronger and better. That's, and you're going to see that's what Joe, Joe did not do that. Joe tried to get the community to come together, but first he, he had to let them know that this was an emergency here. And we need to, we need to stop looking at this like, man, it just happened. Let's just rebuild and come and start over again. No, he was like, this is an emergency. Some attention needs to be had to this. Okay. This is of the, what we say, this is of the utmost importance, right? I digress, let's continue. A day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds, a day of thick darkness, a morning, a morning spread upon the mountains, or as morning spread upon the mountains. The great people and the strong 
there hath not been ever like, neither shall it be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. So he's saying that this locust is like an army that has invaded the land. And he again, he's ringing the bell on the importance or, or, or of the urgency of the matter, right? A fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness. Yea, and nothing shall escape them. Now, I believe what Joel is, is speaking about here is not only is he referencing the locusts, but I also believe that he's referencing what's going to happen when Babylon invades. Right? He, he sees, I believe that he sees this, and he's calling it out. But I digress. That's just my opinion in the matter. But I, again, I don't believe he's just talking about the locusts which invaded. I think he's also talking about there's more to come, right? We you know when the, uh, back in the day when they would have commercials, to, they still have commercials today, but the way the commercials used to be uh, uh, edited where they would have like... Um, they would, the, 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 in the commercials, they would have the product, and then towards the end, they would say, wait, there's more. Well, that's kind of what, you know, Joel is saying here. Wait, there's going to be more, right? And, and I believe he's speaking here about the troops that, are, that will be on the horizon. I digress. Let's continue here. And, and notice what he says here, that just like the locusts, Everything was green and, 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 and thriving. Vegetation was rich and plush and green. And then after the invasion, it's all, it's nothing. It's, it's all gone and, and devastated. And then he, to me, I believe he referenced the troops that will come, the Babylonians, that before them, a plush green land. And then when they get to it, nothing but desolation and fire. A garden of Eden before and then behind them, devastation and, 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 and fire and calamity after them. Once they make their arrival, nothing is ever the same again. And it leaves a generational effect on the community after the destruction. The, the, the aftermath of their destruction is carried forth for generations and generations. Okay? The appearance of them is as the appearance of horses and as horsemen so shall they run. Again, I believe he's talking about the Babylonians here. Like the noise of the chariots on the top of mountains, shall they leap like the noise of flames of fire that devour the stubble as a strong people set in battle array. And look at, look, when you go back to verse 1, look at what he says in verse 1. He says, let all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord cometh and is nigh at hand. So it's not just that he's speaking about the locusts. He's also referencing another event. Wait, there's more. There's another event to take place, right? And he's saying that this is stage one of the invasion. There is another invasion that's coming that's even more damaging than the invasion that we've already have. You know, and in order for us to survive it, we need to come together and, and figure out why it's happening unto us, right? And this, this is going to be the method that, that he takes here. It, it's real interesting because as he references the locust, he's talking about this day of the Lord that's to come. And this day of the Lord seems to be these troops, these, these Babylonian troops and and and. Was, it's not that I'm repeating that there's Babylonian troops, but the term that he calls it is that the day of the Lord. In our modern day, we, we call things, it's the apocalypse. For them, it's, he's, when he mentions the day of the Lord, he's referencing their, their idea of what's considered the apocalypse. Okay? He's looking at what's the apocalypse for them. Pretty interesting here. So he begins to give the description of what they're like in verse 5. Noise of chariots at the top of mountains, shall they leap in the noise of a flame of fire that devoured the stubble as a strong people set in battle array. 
Look at verse 6. Before their faces, the people shall be much pained. All faces shall gather blackness. It's saying that when the people see this approaching army and how sophisticated they are, how, how sophisticated their, their weaponry are, and how organized in the, in, in the function of a troop they appear to be. They're well commanded, right? And when the people see this and see the, the weaponry against them and, and the soldiers that have mounts against them, their, their, their face would be in fear. They'll be in panic. The, 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 some of them will probably be, be in shock when they see the armies that have pulled up against them. And so that's what he's saying here in verse 6. Here, Before their faces, the people should be much pain. It's talking about the terror. Their faces will be terror-stricken, and all they can do is look. Some of them will be just be in shock over the, 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 over the, the, the enemy forces that have mounted against them. Okay? Verse 7, they shall run like mighty men, they shall climb the wall like men of war, and they shall march everyone on his ways, and they shall not break their ranks. They, he's talking about how well, um, how well ordered, they, the, the, the structure of them, the, how ordered they are. Um, the, you ever uh, look at, uh, to, like, North Korean, North Korea, and maybe even China, I think I've seen videos of their soldiers, videos of North Korea soldiers. And maybe, I, I can't remember if I've ever seen Russia, but at least those two nations, North Korea and China, they're military. When they march in the street, their arms swinging, their legs up high as they're marching in the street. And then they'll look to the left while they march, they'll look to the right while they're marching and their legs are real high and their arms constantly swinging. And the one thing you notice, no one is, is, is out of sync. Everyone is in sync as they're high stepping, marching, arms swinging back and forth. Their, their, their head is turned to the left and they're not running into the person in front of them. And they're not falling. They're not slowing down to where they become an impedance to the person behind them. The order continues forward with them, without them even looking, right? They're looking out without them looking ahead. They're just looking off to the right, and they're keeping their steps. They're very well trained, very well organized when you see them marching. Well, that's kind of what Joel is saying here when you look at verse 7. He says, they shall march everyone on his ways, and they shall not break their rank. He's talking about how well organized they are, right? How this well commanded, right? Is and that's the best description that I can give of, of what he of what he might be seeing there. Well, I digress. Look at verse eight. Neither one shall thrust another. They shall walk everyone in his path, and when they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. Our weapons are not sophisticated to be able to match them. We can't, we, we're not going to be able to whoop them. It's, they're going to be hard to take down, right? And, and they got this suit of armor on that if we try to stick them, they're not going to be wounded because they come with apparel. They come with all this armor. And they're so well organized in their structure that even as they carry their weapons and then they're on all of this marching, they're not cutting the person in front. Nor are they cutting the person behind them, the person to the left. No, they keep in their order as they march so much so that you don't have to worry about being poked in the back. By. They, they are well structured, well organized. Okay, so that's the example that he given. And then he said they shall not, he said, uh, if they fall upon the sword, uh, they shall not be wounded. And again, I, I, I referenced it the. Uh, um, that maybe they have a suit of armor on, um, and this is not going to be able to affect them like that, right? They shall run to and fro in the city. They shall run upon the walls. They shall climb up upon the houses. They shall enter in at the windows like a thief. Now, I, I still don't look at this as a supernatural thing. I don't look at it, but I do believe that he gives... Um, I believe that he gives an analogy. Remember, because he starts talking about 
the invasion of the locusts, but then he talks about this actual more severe troop on the horizon. And he's talking about, and, and to me, he's saying that there won't be a wall that they can't scale. There won't be a window that they can't break into. And that's, that's, that's what their orders will be, to scale every wall, uh, to break through every window, to break down every door. That will be their orders. And so, again, I don't believe that this is a supernatural thing, that there are actual locusts, uh, in this sense, crawling up a wall. I believe, again, that he's talking about uh, the soldiers, what their mandate and their command, what their orders will be, and how they will execute those orders. How they're coming into every house, they're, they're scaling every wall, they're breaking down every door, uh, they're, they're coming through the roof. Any way they can get into that dwelling, it's going to happen. The earth shall quake before them, the heavens shall tremble. The sun and the moon shall be dark and the stars shall withdraw their shining. And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great. For he is strong that executeth his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible, and who can abide it? Now, it seems that it begins to shift. Because not only I do I believe that it's talking about what in their time, but now I believe that he begins to forecast out into a time that's going to be apocalyptic for us. Because he starts talking about signs in the heavens, you know, sign, you know this, 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 the sun and the moon and the stars. So he begins to forecast what's going to happen towards the end of the world. So... We, we've seen that with, with the prophets, right, that, it, that it be, there's a localized matter and then there is a global matter that happens. Uh, there, and there are events that happen now. There are events that's going to happen in the near future. And then there are events that are going to happen in the latter days. And they kind of tie everything in to tell people. They, they not only put their own community on notice but they begin to put the world on notice. And I believe that that's what was happening here with Joel. Not only that he put his own community on notice about the locusts and then about the Babylonians, but then I believe that he puts the world on notice to tell us that there's a day of reckoning for us too. And, and the stars and the heavens, the sun and the moon, everything is going to react to that day of the Lord, that apocalyptic day of the Lord that comes for us. Amen? So that's my take on it. And look what he says. He says, uh, for the Lord shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great. I read this, but I want to read it again. For he is strong that executed this word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. And who can abide it? Who will be able to survive it? So again, he begins to talk about an apocalyptic event that's going. Remember, the day of the Lord is an apocalyptic event. And he covers what their apocalypse is, but then he begins to cover what the world apocalypse is going to be. And when, he's, when he does that, he, he, he says, who can survive it? Who is able to stand, in, stand against it? We look at it as the wrath of God being poured out during the time of, 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 of this apocalypse. It's his, it's when, when it comes for the whole global event, the, 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 the latter days of the day of the Lord, we, we consider it to be his wrath. Amen? And, and notice that another thing that we want to we leave points on the field, so to speak. Look at what he says here. It says, for his camp is, it says, for the Lord shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great. Remember, Joel had already attributed the, the locusts to God, that, that God uh, sent the locusts in. And he's also saying that the day of the Lord, God is in charge. And it's his day of reckoning against rebellion, against sinners. And so the things that begin to happen during, the, during Joel's time, Joel's time, and, the, and the, the things that begin to happen during our time, 
God's hand is all in that. Man will try to call it a natural event, you know, but God's hand is all in that, right? It's, 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 man will look at tsunamis, earthquakes and tsunamis and think that they're just happenstances, that they're, but no one attributes that God may be shaking things up or God may be letting the waters flow, you know, what have you. No one ever looks at it that, that is God behind a lot of the calamities. Um, and, and what I mean by it, it are the calamities under order of God, right? To, to try to reconcile our sins, to, to kind of tap us on the shoulder to say, hey, you're headed towards destruction. I need to shake things up in your life to slow you down and, and, and to allow you to understand that you're living in a time of grace to get your act together. Not this time of grace to where you can live sinfully and, and, and freely and not care. I'll, I've got this lake of fire. I don't want you to be in there. I need you to be out of it, not in it, right? So I need, you, I need to shake things up in your life to kind of let you see that, hey, I'm not pleased with what you've been doing and the decisions that you've been making. So I need to shake things up around you to draw your attention, to get you to focus and to, and to not be among these that are against me. Right. Well, so that's that's there it is. And, and he says that it's God's voice and it's, it's his arm. It's God's voice that are commanding his armies and his army may come in the form of of a tsunami, his army may come in the form of an earthquake. He's, he's, he's Lord of hosts, so he commands everything. We look at it as just troops, but the planet is under his control, right? What did Jesus say when they said, you know, you need to, sh you need to shut these people up as they praising you, you know? And Jesus said, but if they shut up, then the rocks would cry out. <laughs> right? this, is, this is what Jesus said. Right. The rocks would cry out. Jesus is that the, the things are alive. Right. Things are alive in the earth. We look at it as just as people or animals. But the trees, the Lord is the Lord of hosts. The trees could be his troops. The rocks could be his troops. You understand what I'm saying? The wind could be his troops. And all he needed to do was give a command. And this is what Joel is saying. The Lord shall utter his voice before his army. He's going to give a command. And he decides which army he sends. The rain, the snow, the wind. It's up to him to which army he's going to use. At the, the locusts, the shark, the bulls, the rhinos, the ants. It's up to him because he is the Lord of hosts. All things are at his disposal. We just have to acknowledge whose sovereign hand is in control. Right? So Joel said, who be able to who will be able to abide it? But he he tells us what to do, right? But we'll get to that. I digress. Let me get out of the way of the scripture. Verse 12. There also now said the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart and with fasting and with reaping. And with mourning, this is this is this is so heavy right here. Joel asks, "Who would be able to abide it?" And then the Lord says, "I'll tell you how not to to be in it, or how to suppress what's coming." Right? I, I'll I'll tell you how to be counted out of my wrath and not counted in, or how to delay what's coming. Okay. And he says, the, the first order of business that God tells you, he says, turn ye even to me with all of your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. Because you got to feel bad. In order to stop doing something, if you don't find anything wrong with it, with what you're doing, then just because somebody tell you to stop, you're not going to stop. Because you don't really see anything wrong with it. You know, well, so-and-so told me that they don't like it, so I guess I got to stop doing it, right? And it's not, it's not coming from the heart. It's not coming from the heart. God is saying that you should be able to see what's wrong with what you're doing, and it should come from your heart so much so that it should affect you. That what's happening in your heart, there should be an outward expression of mourning 
because you've allowed things to come down to this. If you're not, if you're not sad about the sins and you, you know, we don't walk in condemnation, but there should still be some kind of pain. There should still be some kind of embarrassment. There should still be some kind of hurt that something got past you, right? And that, that you want to make it right, uh, you know, and, and, and that's what God is saying. That's when you're on the right path to, to be able to overcome it. But when you don't see anything wrong with it, it's, you're in danger of being reprobate, right? You don't, see, you don't see nothing wrong with what you're doing, how you're living. You know, you kicking it, you know, you, you know, adultery and fornication or, or drugs or what have you. And you don't see nothing wrong with it. Everybody else doing it, right? God is saying the first order, the, the first thing to do to, to keep from being part of my wrath or to delay these things which are coming, which are coming, is to repent, turn away, acknowledge that what you're doing is wrong. Instead of turning from me, turn towards me. Because he's light and he is going to reveal the darkness in us. So instead of turning from him, turn towards him. And then that which you've been doing, acknowledge that it's it's been wrong. That it hasn't been right. And then it, there should be some kind of grief there. That's, 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 that's the process of repentance there. This grief, this, this embarrassment, and this wanting to do better. Wanting to draw close to God instead of running from him. That's part, this is part of the, the redemption process. I digress. Let's continue here. This, and this, this gets real heavy here. Verse 13, rend your heart and not your garments. Turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. A lot of times, the Jews would, as a sign of mourning, as a sign of grief, they would take their clothes and they would tear it. We, the term uh, that they would tear their garments or they would rend their garments. They would do it uh, as an outward, as a out, outward display of grief. Um, but God is saying that inside, they, it, outside it was for show, right? <laughs> it's, it was no different than tearing the page out of a book. It's just for show. God is saying, rend the heart. Not the clothes. If it affects the heart, that's what you're trying to tear. And, and it's real, it's real interesting. Rend your heart and not your garments. Tear your heart and not your clothes. Because that's when true change comes in. You have to know that what you've doing was called what you were what you're doing or what you were doing was causing a problem. That you contributed to the locust being there. You contributed to desolation in your life. You contributed to the earthquakes. If we put God's hands, if we, if we acknowledge God and turn towards him, how many earthquakes will be averted? Do you understand what I'm saying? We wouldn't have to come up with laws for, 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 uh, uh, for carbon, our carbon footprint. And there's for global, for, for climate change. If we acknowledge God, things will take care of itself. But man sees problems on the horizon and they want to legislate it without looking at their heart to see what's wrong, what's out of place. A lot of laws you won't need if you just turn towards God. I digress. Let's continue. And look, we get, in a, we get a, a character assessment of God. This is major. Look at what, the, what verse 13 says. That God is gracious and merciful. Because he gives grace. He gives room for us to, to repent. To turn our ways. To turn, to, to turn towards him. He gives us space and room to do it. And he is merciful. So he's not trying to kill you as soon as you do something wrong. He's not that kind of God. 
And look, he's slow to anger. It don't mean that he's not going to become angry. He's, he, his anger just simmers. It, it's a process. It has to hit the stove. It has to simmer. And then it comes to a boil, right? That's how that, that's how that operates. God, it doesn't say that he doesn't get angry, but it, he, he's not instantly in wrath. But it does build up. And, and the time that it's building up is that time of grace that we have to take it back off the stove, to turn the fire down on it, to keep it, to, to make it cool off, right? And then another character assessment of God, great kindness, great kindness. He is very kind that even if you don't acknowledge him, he still acknowledge you. He's not petty. He is not going to withhold his sunshine from you, his rain. He is not going to tell the earth not to produce on your behalf. Regardless of if you acknowledge your wealth, that God is the one that allowed you to come into your wealth or not, that God has given you great health. If you are, whether you acknowledge, you think it's the gym, you think it's because you don't eat a lot, but it's God that has given you the strength to be mindful, that has given you the understanding, that has called your body to respond to what you're doing to keep it in health. God has caused your body to respond to it, right? So whether you want to acknowledge him or not, he is still kind. He is still sincere. He is still gracious unto us. He is a very, we get a true character assessment of how God is slow to anger, full of kindness, He's not petty, very merciful and very gracious, right? I'm glad to serve the kind of God whom we serve. You know that, you know that commercial, you're in good hands with all. So, well, you're in good hands with the Lord our God. That's his hands, right? Verse 14, look, look at verse 14 kind of. The last statement made in 13 and repented him of the evil. Verse 14 kind of talks about that more. Who knoweth if he will return and repent and leave a blessing behind, even a meat offering or a drink offering unto the Lord your God? Remember, the locusts came through and devoured everything so much so that they, did, they couldn't even... Um, give an offering or grain offering to the Lord because the locusts devoured everything. So we have the path that, that it takes uh, for us to delay or to remove ourselves from the wrath of God. And Joel said we have to try this. And it's not just for, it's not just for his generation, but it's for ours too. We have to try this. We have to repent. And if we do all that we're supposed to do, maybe it's not too late. Maybe God will reverse what had happened. And this is what he's saying here. He says, maybe he says, who knows if God will turn? Who knows if we, if we were able to stop it, that God will pull his troops back and allow stuff to supernaturally manifest again, you know, to where we have something to offer unto him. But we have to, we can't keep trying our ways because our ways has put us in God's way, right? And so now look at what has happened as a result of our own ways. And so if we turn, if we repent, if we turn from our ways and if we turn towards God and we acknowledge our sins and we, we repent of it, Maybe God will go ahead and, and repair that which has been reproached. Maybe he will give us something that we can give back to him. And that's a lot of, that's a, 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 some of the problem too. I was going to say a lot of the problem, but that's at least some of the problem is that what God gives us, he expects us in some form or fashion to give, give part of it back to him. We keep it for ourselves. And it could be your time, your proceeds, um, your praises. People will come to you and be like, hey, you're doing such a fantastic job. 
But do you ever acknowledge that, hey, it's God that called that that gave me the strength and the understanding to execute this job. So to God be the glory. Do you give that back to him? What about God has blessed you to be able to come into good wealth? Have you given towards the kingdom of God? What what about your time that God has given you? You find yourself, man, I've been able to get two, three weeks of vacation. Have you spent any time with God and have you been helping out? Have you been of service to his children? Have you given things back to the Lord that God has put in your hands? And this, we kind of see that here, what he's saying. Not saying that it's the overall problem, but he's saying that this is maybe some of the things to look at. Look at what he says here. I'm going to reread 14. Who knoweth if he will return and repent and leave a blessing behind him? even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God. So who knows if God will leave something for us to be able to give back to him. And if he does that, then that's the path that we need to continue to take. Now, not that, but that's not the overall problem. The overall problem is the sin that has uh, uh, brought all of this calamity upon us. Right. And, and if giving things to God was the answer, then none of the calamity would have happened. Because remember, they were already giving God the offerings, but God was rejecting it because, hey, he's like, your sin is too much. Right. Your sin is too much. And he was like, let me just send my army up in there to invade you. And so the prophet is like, we got to start repenting. We got to turn from our ways. And if God gives us something, if we do all of this and he gives us mercy and favor to, to get something, well, let's give that back to him because he didn't have to do it. So I'm not saying that them keeping stuff from God was the overall problem because we know that they were giving to God, but it just, the sin, God couldn't receive it because it was, it was gift wrapped in sin, so much sin, you know. But uh, I digress, let's continue. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly. And, and I, I hadn't talked much about the fast because it, it already came up here in verse 12. Therefore also now, saith the Lord, turn ye to me with all of your heart and with fasting and with, reaping, with weeping and with mourning. And then if we drop down to verse 15, blow ye the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly. When we fast, there's a few things that are happening. One of the things is that we're overcoming the flesh, the dictates of the flesh, right? And it's, it's the flesh overcoming our, our spirit, man, that causes us to live life uh, incontinently, right? To, with, in compulsion, spontaneous and... And, and without discipline, right? It, it causes, uh, the, because we're more inclined to do what the flesh tells us to do, we act adversarial, av adversarially against God. We're like his adversaries is what I'm trying to say because we're, we're following the dictates of the flesh rather than the spirit. So one of the ways to suppress the dictates of the flesh is to fast, okay? You want to be able to fast. And if you start fasting, we look at, uh, uh, people look at different kinds of fast. Uh, you look, I'm a fast from the television. I'm a fast from my cell phone. I'm a fast from the kitchen, you know, to not eat. And I would suggest if you fast, fast in all the areas of weakness as you can. If, if you know, if, if call a fast, a fast, Maybe I, I'm, I'm not going to be eating and in doing so, I'm not watching TV. I'm just using, I'm not messing with my cell phone. I'm not taking calls that day. I just want to hang out with the Lord. And that, that's a major way of being able to overcome the dictates of the flesh is to fast. And it, we're not going to talk about the the physical benefits of fasting um 
there, which there are, there are just some major physical benefits to it. Um, but spiritually, that's one of the things that the doctor prescribed is fasting, turning away from those things that you've engulfed yourself in, that you felt like you couldn't live without. And just have a day set aside with you and the Lord. I'm not eating. I'm not drinking. Um, I'm not in, engaging in, in, in my phone or my television. I'm just setting this moment aside. He says, turn away and, and fast. And he says, let it not just be an uh, uh, isolated fast, fast um, uh, individual fast, but collectively let the nation fast, right? And, and that's going to get God's attention because you're, you're surrendering yourself. You're sacrificing your appetite and everything else to surrender to the Lord, to, 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 hear, to be able to hear him. You're kind of purging and cleaning the appetite of the flesh out. You're removing that out of your system. And, and you're, you're indulging yourself in the Lord. So as you get yourself in a state of fast, make sure you fill yourself with nourishment from God. His word, gospel music, good sermons. Make sure you're, whatever you're taking out of your system as far as food and, and natural things and earthly things, make sure you're replacing it with heavenly things, right? That's, that's how you get his attention there. So it says that this is a call to arms for the nation. Blow ye the trumpet. Verse 16, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, those that suck the breast, even the babies. Let us all come together and acknowledge our faults before the Lord and turn and repent before him. Let the bridegroom go forth out of his chamber and even the bride out of her closet. He's like, I don't care what engage. I don't care if you got a little baby. I don't care if you're engaged or you got a wedding ceremony. Let's put all of these things to all these cares to the side and let's come together and come before the Lord and acknowledge our wrong and let him know that he has a commitment from us as far as repentance and surrendering ourselves to his will and his ways. Let the priest, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar and let them say, spare thy people, O Lord, give not thy inheritance to reproach that the heathen should rule over, over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, where is their God? And this is why I believe that, and to some extent he was not just talking about locusts, but he was actually talking about the Babylonians. Because here he says that he's, he's, he's saying that if we all come together as a nation and then we cry out to God that the, the, uh, uh, the priest and the ministers should intercede and, 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 and ask God to not let them be subject to the Gentiles that the Gentiles would rule over them. And then, so much so, the Gentiles will be saying, where is their God? <laughs> Look, their God abandoned them if, because we were able to, to take, you know, to subdue them. Where is their God? So again, I believe he's also mentioning the, uh, an, an army, a tangible army that will come and, and try to subdue them, in this case, that being the Babylons, the Babylonians, rather. Amen? So that was, and so his concern was, you know, if we all come together as a nation, not just as a community, but as a nation, and that we would seek the Lord, and that we would all repent, that we would turn from our wicked ways, then our spiritual leaders should be able to cry out to the Lord, and ask him to forgive us and to spare us from allowing us to be ruled by the heathens, right? And that's, and that, and that's the bottom line. And so we have to kind of do the same thing, that we repent, we turn from our wickedness, we fast, we pray unto the Lord, and we ask him to not let our sins rule over us, to not let our weaknesses rule over us, right? We have to ask him, but we have to be willing to acknowledge what it is that we've done wrong and stop putting things before God. Don't put the babies before him, your, your wedding and your job. Stop putting things before God. 
make him first. And the, the bondage that you find yourself in, if you repent, if you fast, if, if you acknowledge that what you've done was wrong, so much so that you feel bad about it, you're on the right path, right? Now, look at this. This, this is God's response. This is verse 18. If we do what we're supposed to do, then we can expect God to do what he's going to do. And this is verse 18. Then will the Lord be jealous for his land and pity his people. Yea, the Lord will answer and say unto his people, Behold, I will send corn. That word corn is grain. Behold, I will send grain and wine and oil, and ye shall be satisfied therewith. And I will no more make you a reproach among the heathen. But I will remove far off from you the northern army and will drive him into the land barren and desolate. And with his face toward the east side and his hinder part towards the, out, the, the outmost sea. And, the stink, and his stink shall come up and his ill savior shall, shall come up before he, uh, because he has done great things. So God is saying that that army that I will send to, to subdue you, if you would do right by me, then I will remove that army from you. And then and instead of you having judgment against you, I will put judgment against this army that I would send in there because of the things that they've done. Right. I would I'll put judgment on them rather than on you. OK. Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice for the Lord will do great things. Be not afraid, ye beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness do spring, for the trees bear her fruit, and the fig tree and the vine do yield their strength. Hold on to verse 22. I want to go back up to verse 20. And there is something that I, I, I wanted to show you here. In verse 20, just, if you can indulge me, let me just read the whole scripture again so that I can make the point. But I will remove far off from you the northern army and will drive them into the land barren and desolate with his face toward the east, the east sea and his hinder parts toward the outmost sea or the utmost sea rather. And his stink shall come up and his ill savior shall come up because he has done great things. Now, it's talking about his stink, his ill savior, his ill savor, I should say come up before the Lord. The stench of his sins come up before the Lord. This is a supernatural thing. Jesus is a sweet aroma for us. We still, our righteousness is still as filthy rags in the eyes of the Lord. But what allows him to, because he is such a holy God, very, very holy what allows him to be able to deal with us is because he constantly smells the sweet aroma of his son concerning us. Once we are covered by the blood of Jesus, by the lamb of by, by the blood of the lamb, that sweet savor that's on Christ permeates from us. And we're able to stand in the presence of the Lord. But without that, the stink of our sins. I have a strong nose, right? My, no <laughs> my wife talks about my nose. My nose is like a bloodhound. I mean, I, I there's things that I can smell and just be like, oh, my goodness, right? I have a, 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 a sensitive nose, right? God, when, when you're not covered by the blood, God smells the stink that some people they don't want to deal with them because they're not they're not covered by the blood of the sun. Therefore, the permeation of the sweet savor on the sun is not covering them. People that haven't uh, people that haven't um, turned towards the Lord. So the stink of their deeds testifies against them. It's a spiritual thing. The the stink of the adultery, that must have a particular smell on it. 
fornication must have a particular smell. Lies must have a particular stink on it. So your stink testifies against you, right? <laughs> you just stink, right? God can't deal with that. He's a holy God. And so it's important for us to come under the blood of the lamb because he washes the stink and the filth off us. The scriptures tells us that God is righteous. He's faithful and righteous to forgive us and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness, right? He's washing the stink off of us through the blood of the lamb, right? And so the, that sweet savor that comes from the, the, the lamb is also attributed unto us. That's why it's so important to be saved. It's important to go through water baptism so that we can receive the sweet, the, the sweet aroma that Christ gives needs to come off of us too. And our sins, it, it's not just me saying this. Look at what he says there. Um, he's saying that his ill savior shall come up, that the stink of his sins come up. He says, because he has done great things. So the stink of his sins permeate heaven and God wants to take action against that because he just stank that the sins of people he they just stank and God is a holy God and he just don't like that he just don't he don't deal with that right so I, I find that rather interesting there that was one of the things that I, I see there and just um, that I thought was real powerful so fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. Be not afraid, ye beasts of the field, nor the pastures of the wilderness. He says, for the pastures of the wilderness do spring, for the trees bear fruit. The fig tree and the vine tree do yield their strength. God is saying, God is talking about the restoration of things. And he said that he'll be faithful to restore. I, I know you see the devastation of, of what the locust has done. And I know it looks hopeless, but if you turn towards me, I will make it better than it was before. I'll do that for you. Things will be plush again, thriving, your economy thriving, everything. But this is the path to having a full restoration. Not you rebuilding and, and being prideful that I'm going to rebuild, but acknowledging what you've done and then letting, and then the way you fix it is to repent from it and then God repairs the breach that's what we're seeing here again verse 22 bears repeating be not afraid ye beast of the field he's even mindful of the beast he's the beast. God is saying I know right now it looks like y'all got nothing to eat but that's because of the sin once we put the sin away trust me you'll be thriving again you'll be gaining weight he says, for the pastures of the wilderness do spring and the trees bear the fruit, the fig trees and the vineyards do yield, the vines do yield their strength. Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the former rain moderately. And he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, the latter rain in the first month. So I'm not going to withhold my rain again. I will not only give you the rain, but I'll make it come good. Not so much that it be torrential downfalls, but I'll make sure you have more than enough water for your vegetation. So the, that, 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 that rain in the springtime and that rain in the autumn, I'll make sure you have plenty of it because that's needed for, for your harvest. I will make sure. Okay, that's God's promise. And the floor shall be full of wheat and the vat shall overflow with the wine and the oil. And look, I will restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten, the canker worm, the caterpillar, the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. That should put you in tears. Because it's not just isolated to them. When we're in sin, our losses are in stages. There's an evolution to our loss when we're in sin. And God is saying that if you return to me, if you acknowledge what you've done wrong, and you turn to me from your heart, 
not just out, not just lip service, not just outward stuff. Don't come to me fake. Don't come to me ripping your clothes, but inside you still a ravaging wolf. You still doing things. Don't come to me as a hypocrite. But if you come to me sincere from the heart and you acknowledge what it was that you've done wrong and you surrender yourself, you fast, you pray, you turn away from your sins. I will restore. I will repair the breach and I will restore all the losses that you've experienced through the evolution of loss. I'm going to repair all that and make it seamless. That's God speaking and given a promise that if you do it his way, all that you lost, you know who we have as an example about the, the restoration of things? Not that Job did anything wrong, but all the loss, because he experienced his loss in, in stages as well. But not that he sinned, it was just that he was targeted by the enemy. But look at the look at the, the, the evolution of his loss. Look at the evolution of his gain, what God restored unto him. A greater family, more riches than he could have ever wanted. You know, and surely his relationship with God was even better because he went through something. Look, I mean, and then the, the honor that he had because from because his friends was dogging him out, his wife was dogging him out. But because Job held the ground, because he stood his ground, you know, he, he, he wavered a bit. He was a bit shaking, but he stood his ground. And because he stood, God repaired the breach and restored everything. Made things, gave him more than he lost. And this is what God is saying. This is what God is saying to us individually and collectively. Everything belongs to God. He owns everything. All the worlds, all the heavens, all the businesses, all the riches. You know, God is not a genie. We don't rub him and make, a, make three wishes. It's not like that. But he has no problem. And our ministry is not a, a, um, a prosperity ministry based on uh, houses and cars. And our ministry is not based in our, our when we talk about prosperity we don't look at prosperity in those means we teach prosperity about the richness of the relationship that you have with God and what father would not want to give his give his son things give his daughter things uh, we look at prosperity in the richness of the relationship that you have with God himself and all of those things that that the, that the enemy has been allowed to take through your sins, through even the filth and the stink of your sins. Once you repent and God cleanse you from, from the unrighteousness, God cleanse you. Um, the things that he restored to you to make it better than it had ever been. Amen. That's God's promise unto us. And God let you know that it was my hand that was against you because you put your hand against me. Look at what he says here. He was like, in, in verse 25, I will restore to you the years that the locusts had eaten, the canker worm, the, 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 the caterpillar, the palm. And he said, you've gone through your, you've gone through this for years. Some people have that, that, that are, you know, I, some people that, that are believers have been going through things for decades. Because when they get close to coming out, they find a way to stay in, just like the children of Israel. They were, they, uh, a 40-day journey became a 40-year journey. They, their days, they, actually, to get to the promised land should have only taken them about a, a week or two. It took them 40 years to get to the promised land. They extended it because of the, the, the sins that, they permit it in their lives, right? And these are the years of the canker worm, the year of the palmer worm, the, year the, the years that the caterpillar, caterpillar has taken, the years 
all the, the robberies, the assaults against us uh, from our sins and the place that we gave the enemy. And we haven't we have not been able to prosper in our relationship with God or in, in any other function of life because we've been held up so long by being robbed so often. It had become a way of life. And God is saying that it don't have to be a way of life. If you turn towards me, we we can put this away once and for all. But you need to acknowledge what's been happening to you all this time. Amen. You've probably been in a bad relationship. You've probably been hanging out with this married man or married woman for decades. And you're still going to church, praising God and doing all of these things. And then going back and still hanging out throughout the week with that married individual. Now their husband or their wife have gotten used to their adulteries and they just let them be. And you hanging out casually with them. And you wondering why and you paying your tithes and, you know, and all this other stuff. And you wondering why you still can't get ahead. It, the canker worm, the, paddle ki the, the, the caterpillar, things have showed up years ago. You invited them in and they've just been robbed. You can't get ahead on your job. You can't get ahead with your children, uh, uh, you know, your, your finances, Everything that's been happening, you've been robbed, is because you allowed the thief to come in. You invited a man through your sins. And God said, you got to acknowledge it. You got to come out of it. You got to, just because you're alive don't mean I permitted it. I didn't sign off on it because you, you think I signed off on it because you're still out here walking and breathing and you were able to go, go out to eat from time to time, you know? You have some good days, but you think I signed off on it because you have some good days. You're still hemorrhaging. You're still leaking the blessings. You got, you got curses in place of your blessings. All because you refuse to let go of the unrighteous thing. And it's been the thief robbing you. You got used to the, to the robbery. <laughs> you getting used to it. You expect to be robbed. Your paycheck getting garnished. You know, you trying to, yo, I had to give me a second job. They don't find out about the second job and they start garnishing that. <laughs> it's, but it's the root of it is the sin, some area of sin in your life that has offended God. And you've lived with the offense against God because you've, you, you refuse to turn. But God is saying, look, I'm letting you know I've been behind your loss because you've been in front of it. <laughs> so, hey, but I'm telling you, we, you don't have to live like this. My son came that you may have life and have it more abundantly. You don't have to live like that. You just chose to. I digress. We, we still got some things to cover here. I know I'm going long here. God says, if you do it my way, verse 26, ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. Praise the name of the Lord your God that you have dealt wondrously, that, that praise the Lord your God that have dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be ashamed. And you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God and none else. And my people shall never be ashamed. That includes us because we are, now, we are now children of the Most High God through Jesus Christ. We have no reason to be walking around here depressed and in, in despair. Desolation has robbed us. You know, we're bait. Uh, Pete, uh, David said, I once was young, but now I'm old. I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. And when you're to the point that you're begging bread, something has robbed the storehouse. Something has robbed you. Some sin 
has has crept in some thief has crept in in the form of pornography in the form of homosexuality in the form of adultery in the form of wrath or anger in the form of unforgiveness in the form of being merciless something has some thief has come in and then threw up stink on you Right? You, your stink has come up before the Lord and you have drawn this attention. He's not, when it comes to you, he's not smelling that sweet aroma of his son. He smelled the, the stink of theft or the stink of anger, the stink of hate on you, the, the, the stink of greed, the stink of covetedness, the stink of adultery, the stink of homosexuality. There's some stench that has overridden the smell of the aroma of Christ concerning you. You've been taking a bath in the stink of your sin. And you've turned because you've turned away from God, you've turned away from the aroma of Christ. And you have the outward appearance coming before the Lord. You have the outward appearance. You know, hey man, Pastor, you know, you up in church. Some of you watching the video now, hey man, Pastor, you telling and as soon as you cut the video off, you calling. The adultery or the fornication. As soon as you turn the video off. Some of you getting mad now with turning the video off. It's okay. But I'm here to tell you, you don't have to live the way you've been living. And then blaming God when things ain't working out for you. Ah, let me, let me move on. We still got a few more things to cover here. Now, verse 28. Verse 28. This is what I said at the beginning of our, of our recording here that we're going to see it, it affects us and we've already started. This is a promise that God has fulfilled that affects us even today, right? And that we get an opportunity to walk in it, okay? So look at this. This is what Joel or Yoel said uh, then that God said through him. Look at this, verse 28. It shall come to pass afterwards that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, not just Gentiles. I mean, I'm sorry, not just Jews, but Gentiles as well. That's why I said all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. God is saying that I'm going to, instead of my spirit being on the outside of you, I'm going to place my spirit on the inside of you. How do we know this? Well, first of all, let's go, let's go to Genesis uh, chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6. And we'll see God's spirit on the outside. Genesis chapter 6, verse 1. It came to pass that when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and the daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men, that they were fair. And they took them wise of all that they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he is, also, for that he is flesh, or that he also is flesh, rather. His days shall be 120 years. So God is saying that my spirit should not always contend with men. My spirit is abiding with men trying to get him to walk right and he just won't do it. His spirit being on the outside of us. So now God is saying that I'm going to place my spirit on the inside of them. And that's what this is saying. It shall come to pass afterwards that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. So it's going to come on the inside. And, and the effects of my spirit being on, on, on the flesh or, or on people is they're going to be able to have visions and dreams and they'll speak with tongues and various things of the sort, right? Because my spirit will now be inside of them. I will show wonders in heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. So there is an apocalyptic event that is going to come and shake the whole world. Prior to that event happening, my spirit will overtake man by now going inside of man. The first one to, to let it have happened was Jesus, who is the Christ, the Messiah. The Spirit of God came in on him and fell upon him and was inside of him. Okay? So he was the first. 
And then the spirit of God, after his ascension, the spirit of God begins to fall upon all. And we're going to read the event when it first happened. Okay, but it's prophesied here that it's going to happen. And then after this event, the major event that's coming, and, and God is getting us ready by putting his spirit inside of us because there is a major event that's going to come and shake the whole world. And those of us that have the spirit of God inside of us, it's going to help us to, uh, to, what did Joel say? Who shall abide it? The day of the Lord when it cometh, who shall abide it? It's going to help us to be able to stand uh, away from it, to not be partakers of this uh, uh, apocalyptic event that's going to overtake the world. And, and Joel talks about it. He sees it right here. And remember, when, when the locust came, it blotted out the sun. It was so much. Well, Joel said that, Joel or Yoel says that there's going to be an apocalyptic event that's going to blot out the sun and stuff and, and the moon and the star. It's going to have an effect, uh, um, celestial as well as a global effect, right? But we have to have God's spirit inside that's going to help us navigate so that we don't be attributed, so that the wrath of God is not attributed unto us. So God is saying that he will be no respecter of persons when it comes to his spirit. Anybody that put themselves in position to receive it will receive it. Okay. He says also the servants upon the hand, he says also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirits and I will show wonders in the celestials, wonders in the heavens and in the earth and blood and fire, pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered. Hi, God. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. It's not enough to call upon the name of the Lord. But look at, look at what it says. Who shall call upon the name of the Lord? You're making him Lord. It's not just to say, Jesus, help me. But you're committing to obeying him. Making him Lord. Because if you're going to pick and choose what you're going to obey and what you're not going to obey, then he's not really Lord of your life. You have to be willing to follow his plan of salvation. If you pick and choose and say, I, I, I can use this, but I don't need that. Did you die for all humanity? Or did he die for all humanity? Right? So I'll close with what I told you was in Acts. Go with me to Acts chapter 2. And we'll read about. The spirit of the, the promise that God kept, the, the pouring out of his Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 2, verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. So clo cloven tongues are tongues that were divided, different tongues. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Remember we talked about the Spirit being on the outside? The pouring out of, of God's Spirit now fills the inside. Think of a glass. Think of us being the vessel, and then God just pours his spirit inside of us. Before the condensation, before we didn't have it on the inside, there was just condensation on the outside, which was God's spirit. But now, instead of that condensation just being on the outside, there is fullness inside of us. We represent, in this analogy, we represent the glass. Again, before there was condensation, but no filling of the spirit. Now the inside is God's spirit inside of us. The effects of it is not only we're 
field inside, but you could also have the condensation on the outside as well. So that's just a crash course of what's saying here. They were all filled, meaning that the spirit was inside of us with the Holy Ghost and began to speak other tongues as the spirit gave them utterance. And when they spoke other tongues, they were able to speak in other languages, having never uh, been bilingual or trilingual, only able to speak in their own native tongue. Now they had the ability to speak in various uh, uh, tongues here. Verse 5, and this is one of the effects, or this is, um, this is not the only sign of, of God's Holy Ghost being in you. This was just one of the evidences of that happening. There were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. So the default, for the observation of Pentecost, there were people there that were not just Jews, but there were other nationalities there as well as what the scripture is saying. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in their own language. And they were all amazed and they marveled, saying one to another, Behold, not all the, behold, are not all these which speak, are, are they not Galilean? So they were like, how does a Galilean know how to speak Egyptian? How does a Galilean know how to speak Asian? They were able to hear men speaking and the people, the guests that were there, that were of a, of a different nationality, they were able to hear the testimonies in a foreign language. God's testimonies, God's, God's wondrous works being broadcast through those Galileans uh, uh, in a different language. They were able to understand the language. I digress. Let's continue here. And they were all amazed and they marveled, saying one to another, Behold, not, are not all these that speak Galilean? And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? Parthians and Medes, Elamites and dwellers in Mesopotamia, in Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and in Asia. All of these people from various nationalities were able to hear the testimonies of God from these simple Galileans, but they were able to hear the testimony of God in their own language. Phrygia, uh, Pamphylia in Egypt and parts of Libya, Serene, strangers of Rome and Jews and proselytes and Cretes and Arabians. We do hear them speak in our tongue the wonderful works of God. They were hearing the testimonies of God through these people who have never been given uh, 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 multiple language courses. They were able to hear it, the Spirit of God dwelling in them and gave them the ability to speak in another language. And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, what meaneth this? Others mocking said, these are men full of new wine. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, ye men of Judea, and all that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken, as you suppose, sin, but it is only the third hour of the day. So this is like nine o'clock in the morning. Why are you saying that the only way this is possible is because they're drunk? Why are people always trying to discount the miracles of God? All right, they're, they're drunk. That's why they're it's just like at nine o'clock in the morning. Who get drunk that early? But this is what which but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Yoel or Joel. Hmm? And so he, get, he begins to say what was said. And it shall come to pass in the last days, said God, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. So that's that. Amen. So we get an opportunity to see the, the and, and, and God gives us his spirit because there was a day as, as Joel or Joel was saying about his time about the apocalyptic events that would occur in his time, he's also was speaking about the time that will come for us where we would experience apocalyptic events. And, and this culminating to the latter days of our time. And what gets us ready is the reception of God's Holy Spirit inside of us. We have to be receptive of it. And, and for us to receive it, we have to be willing to repent 
and to turn away, be baptized, every one of you, for the remission of sins in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So, eternal God, I thank you for the opportunity to speak and proclaim your truth, the word. I thank you for, the, for those who you have invited to hear this Bible study, to hear this message, to get an opportunity to examine their life to see in what form the thief has come into their life and how to get rid of the thief and how to have what was stolen from them replenished after they have turned their heart towards you, after they have placed their hearts back into your hands rather than against you. Father, thank you for being the light that shines light through all of our lives, through all of our days to show us where we stand with you. So I ask God that you would continue to be merciful that you would continue to work your wonders in our lives individually and collectively, that you would help us to see if we've given place to the enemy and give us the strength to repent and to call upon the name of the Lord, that being the Lord Jesus Christ, that we would be obedient to him in every way that we would call upon him and so that we can find deliverance even where you are. God, thank you for the path of salvation. Thank you that your word is easy to entreat. And thank you for giving us your Holy Ghost. This is all petition before you. This is a petition of, of gladness and thanksgiving. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Go with me quickly uh, to Matthew 11. I'll read through these very quick. This is the path. You can always find, uh, if you go to our website, you can always find the path laid out for you to obtain the gift of salvation. We've read about what's going to happen to those that walk contrary to the ordinances and the precepts of God, those that are in con contradiction of his righteousness, the fate that will befall them. Here is how, here's how you are saved from that. It starts with Jesus Christ offering you an invitation to be saved. He says, come unto me. This is Matthew chapter 11, beginning at verse 28. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The one thing you got to understand is he... He has, his, he has the best life that he wants to give you. He's got your, he's got your interests at heart that he wants you to come and join him, be a part of the family, come and be partakers of his kingdom, right? And then if he says, take and learn, he says, learn of me. Forget what they've been saying, what the world has been saying about me. You try me for yourself and come and learn of me. And what, and what you'll find out is how, is how I have your best interests at heart. You'll find that out, that I'm for you before I'm against you. You'll find that out. But, you, but when you come to him, you have to turn away from the world because it's not going to work in the kingdom of God. Remember, we spent the, the, better, the better part of an hour and a half talking about how the old world is going to fade away and God is ushering in the new world. He's ushering in the new heaven and the new earth and the old is going to be done away with. And so now is the time for us to prepare for what will be. And Christ is offering us, the Messiah, Emmanuel, he is offering that platform, that bridge of transition and change unto us. Amen? Go with me to Romans chapter 11. 
or chap Romans, I'm sorry, Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 13. Romans 10, verses 9 through 13. This is how you accept Jesus as Lord. This is how you accept his invitation. You first turn away from the world, because when he says, come unto me, that means leave the world behind and come to me. Now, you commit to making him Lord of your life. Romans chapter 10, verse 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. You know how you give your wedding vows. You say, do, the, the man of God will say, do you take this man or do you take this woman to be your lawfully wedded husband or your lawfully wedded wife? And you say, I do, right? Well, this is what you're saying to Jesus. That if thou shalt confess with the mouth the Lord Jesus, you're saying, I do make you Lord of my life. That's what you're doing. I make you Lord of my life. I commit to marrying you and to obeying you. Okay? And shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. It's factoring in confession and faith that you believe, you believe that Jesus is the only begotten Son of God that laid down his life for us and was and was brought back to life after three days and three nights and is alive forevermore. And he is the one that will reign and rule in the millennium. The safekeeping of our souls have been placed in his hands. Amen. And if you believe it and you confess that he is Lord, you are saved. What are you being saved from? We just covered that. We just covered that. That's you're being saved from the wrath of God that's going to fall upon the whole the whole world. Amen. I will go back and reference the Gospel of John chapter 3 and 36, but I want you to do it. It's basically saying what we've already said. Your re, your rejection of your rebellion against God and your rejection of his only begotten son. And, and that's the wrath. But if you take this path, you enjoy, you, 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 uh, excuse me. If you take this path, you're removed from the wrath that's going to come upon the earth. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. And so there's good and bad. That as God would punish the children of Israel, he will punish his children that are Gentiles. And the good is that a God was saving his children, the Jews. He's also looking to save us, the Gentiles. So there's no difference with God when it comes to salvation being offered between the Jews and the Gentiles. There's no difference when it comes to that. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. God is going to save you. He promises to do that. But you have to put yourself in position to be saved by turning away from your sins. That's repentance. By confessing Jesus as Lord. Okay? Calling upon him and letting him know that I make you Lord of my life. Quickly go with me to 1 John chapter 1 verses 8 through 10. 1 John chapter 1 verses 8 through 10. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. This is letting you know this is part of that path when christ says come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden this is what it means to come to him turning away from your sins and then let god know let him know through prayer what it is that you repented of so that it never gets brought up again god even takes it out of the enemy because the enemy is the accuser of the brethren at, at this time he has he has permission to go to the throne of God to accuse us right there at the throne. But the time is going to come to where he's going to be put into the pit. But until he's put into the pit, those things that you've been forgiven of and that the blood of the lamb has washed you clean of, 
God doesn't give the enemy permission to, to bring it up because God himself is not trying to hear about it. And as long as you turned away from it, you disarm the enemy. You take away his argument against you. That's, that's the bottom line. But if you're still living in your sin, then the enemy is constantly bringing it up because he wants God to penalize you. He wants God to turn him loose on you. Okay? And so once you do what you're supposed to and you start walking right with God, then the enemy has to, he has to get up off of you. He can't even bring a case against you. He could try to make one, but he can't bring one. He could try to tempt you, but as long as you're covered in the armor of God and you resist him, he has nothing to complain about at the throne of God. Amen? If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. If you're not honest about what's broken about you, then you can't be saved. If you live in deceit and dishonesty, there's nothing that the word can do for you. Amen? Lastly, and quickly, go with me to Acts chapter 2, verses 36 through 47. Acts chapter 2, verses 36 through 47. And I'll just read through this. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know surely that God had made that same Jesus whom you've crucified, both Lord and Christ. And what Peter is saying here is that surely those that have gathered here in this upper room on this particular day of Pentecost, that's the backdrop of what's going on here. Surely those that are here, it's hard to believe that any of you would have taken nails and drive them through the hands of Jesus, crucifying them on the cross, taking nails and driving them through the feet as he was crucified on the cross. But your lifestyle, those unrepented sins, those sins that you haven't repented of, that, that makes you just as guilty as those that had done that to him. Okay, you may say, I, I, I'm not doing all those things. But sin in your life, period, makes you just as guilty, guilty as those that had nailed Jesus to the cross. Now, when they heard this, they were convicted or they were pricked in their heart. And they said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and, bro men and brethren, what shall we do? What can we do to get our life in order? When God convicts us, he's letting us know that there's something amiss within our lives and it's going to cost us if we don't get those things reconciled between him and ourselves. If we don't do our part to, to get a handle on that stuff, it's going to cost us, right? And God is convicting you to try to move you to take action, okay? So don't disregard those convictions. God got, he has that there for a reason. And that means that he hasn't given up on you. When he convicts you, it's because he hasn't given up on you. So stop giving up on yourself. Do something about what's happening with your situation. Take hold of it before God turns you over. You don't want him to turn you over. Amen? When I say turn you over, turn you over to the enemy or turn you over to yourself. That's the worst that he can do to you. So Peter says, repent. Turn away from your sins first and foremost. Then Peter gives us the instruction, be ye baptized you know, in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins. Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus for the, for the remission of sins. Now, let's talk about the ceremony of baptism. Christ was nailed to the cross, laying down his life, meaning that he died on the cross, taken down off the cross, and laid to rest in the tomb. He was laid to rest in the tomb. Remember, he was dead. For three days and for three nights, he laid to rest. After three days and three nights, he was brought back to life. Laid to rest brought back to life okay when we go through the ceremony of baptism we are uh, some fully submerged in the water that represents us being buried in christ jesus okay when we go down into the water being fully submerged we are buried in jesus christ when we come up out of the water we are resurrected in jesus christ your old man goes down your new man comes up all of your sins are washed away. You remember in our Bible study, we talked about God getting rid of the old to make room for the new. 
This is the process of you inheriting the new, your name being counted amongst those in the Lamb's Book of Life. This is that process. Your old man has to be done and away with. Your new man has to come forth so that you can take part in the new world uh, uh, with the kingdom of God. Amen. That starts now. Your training of inheriting that which is to come starts now. But the old man has to go down. The new man has to come up. Amen. So that's the ceremony of baptism. That's why we do it. We're told to do it. And I've given you the reason of why we go through it. So that your old man can go down and your new man can come up and all of your sins can be washed away. So make sure you get it done. Amen. Um, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. God puts his spirit inside of us to seal us up. We're the only ones that can break the seal. People contend with that statement that I make, but God is a God of free will. And if you don't want to be saved no more, you can you just be like, God, I'm tired of it. I'm going to do what I want to do. That's you breaking the seal. Okay. That's the only way that, that the, the enemy don't have the, the, the enemy don't have the power or authority to break your seal. He can tempt you to get you to break your own seal. You're sealed up. Imagine uh, you're being put in an envelope and that envelope is sealed up. Nobody has the authority to, to break that seal open but the Lamb of God and you. You can break that seal by saying, I don't want to be saved no more. I don't want to live according. To, and you go on about your life and you're perished with the rest. Amen. The, the enemy don't have, all he can do is tempt you to make you try to do it against yourself. So that's why God gives us his spirit so that he can be inside of us. His spirit is constantly uh, uh, transforming us on the inside out, giving you a hunger and a thirst of righteousness, making you, moving you towards prayer, uh, uh, getting into the doctrine of, of the word of God. You know, it's moving you towards those holy and godly things that when you were in, as a natural man, you thought these things were foolish. Now, because you're spiritual, having received the spirit of God and you're spiritual, these things are not are not foolish to you any longer. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to those that are far off, even as many as the Lord God shall call. God is always trying to call us out of darkness, but it's up to us if we're willing to come into the light that he's that he offers us. He's always the invitation is always there. But it's up to you if you're going to accept it. And it don't matter where you come from or what, you, or what you've done. What matters is what you're willing to do at this point. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, save yourselves from this untoward generation. That applies to us today. Save yourselves from this crooked or perverse generation. That applies to us. That's what we when reading about in Isaiah, about those that didn't separate themselves, those that didn't call upon Jesus Christ to be Lord. Amen. And that's what that's what Peter is constantly telling us. We've got to take this thing seriously. Then they that gladly received the word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3000 souls. And now and here is another path set before us how to grow stronger and closer to God. They continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in breaking of bread and in prayers. God keeps, whatever God used to get you saved, whether it's Bible study, uh, you, 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 you started following a friend to the place of worship and, and you received, you, you started receiving some truth. Whatever God has done to get you on the path to salvation, it takes a, a practice and a continuation of those things to keep you getting stronger. It takes a daily dose or, or a regimen of those same activities to not only get you stronger, but to see you to the end. Once you start pulling back on those things, then you're in danger of falling back. And once you're in danger, once you're, you're in danger of stopping and from stopping, you're in danger of falling back, which in which is backsliding. So don't stop doing those things 
that got you to where you are. It, you, it takes a continuation of that, a regimen of that to keep you moving forward. Amen? Uh, verse 43, fear came upon every soul. Many wonders and signs were done by the apostles and all that believed were, com were together and had all things common. This is the brotherhood. It's talking about the brotherhood. They sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. God, we take this opportunity to thank you for the path of salvation, for the gift of life, the gift of eternal life with you and with Jesus who is Christ. Father, I thank you also for calling all of us out of darkness and giving us an opportunity to take hold of that light. Father, those that have accepted the call, those that have accepted the invitation, we pray for them that you help them to remain repentant. Father, that they accept Jesus as Lord and that they become sons and daughters of God and not return back to their former lust. We pray for them, Father, that you would place them in places of worship, Father, to where they can not only worship you, but magnify Jesus and edify our brothers and sisters. We pray that not only you fill them with the Spirit of God, but that you also give them an understanding of their gifts and callings and use them for the sake of your glory. It's our petition for those whom you've called out of darkness and have answered the call. Father, I thank you for increasing the size of our family and keeping the door open for us to become citizens of the kingdom of God. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name, and we pray. Amen. Uh, this is Numbers chapter 6, verses 24 through 26. If you have any unrepented sin in your life, you won't be able to take advantage of these blessings. Remember, sin brings about curses. Obedience brings about your blessings, right? And so this is a blessing. The word bless is littered all in this, right? But you can't let curses, you know, be a soldier at the gate uh, warding off your blessings. You know, because you, you got sin in the gate, so curses is standing outside of the gate, may, you know, bombarding any blessings that would otherwise enter in. So you got to do away with, you got to get rid of the, 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 the sins in your life so that you can dismiss the curses that are standing guard. Uh, I watch, my wife and I, lately we've been watching The Lord of the Rings. I don't remember, there's three of them, man. <laughs> and if you ever go back and watch those, I mean, those like, if you watch all three of them, that's a good 12 hours, right? But they're very, if they, they really do have such a spiritual meaning to it. I don't remember which one, if it's the first or the second or the third, but there was a king. And this king had this, this, um, like his 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 hand his his right hand person had put some kind of spell over him and so the king couldn't receive any counsel he was like a zombie he couldn't rule he he couldn't give good orders he couldn't call out good things he couldn't he couldn't acknowledge things all he can do was be a servant to the to darkness because his right-hand person that didn't have his best interest at heart had a spell over him. It's similar, to having, it's similar to having sin in your life. And that sin is stopping any goodness from coming at you. Do you see what I'm saying? It's deflecting any goodness from coming at you. Right? And, and then outside of the, of the gates, it's got curses reinforcing the, the entrance to make sure blessings can't come in. That's how significant it is. So you've got to make sure that you get sins out of your life 
so that you can fully embrace what God is trying to give you. Amen. Remember, it's a God of free will. So he is he, he respects the fact that you choose curses over blessings. He respects that. OK. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. I loose this on you that you would receive it in Jesus' name, that you prosper, that you're transformed, and that you're anchored down in the will of God, and that you place not only God but his kingdom first, always at all, and at all times, that you yourself shall prosper. Receive the blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. I thank you for your your uh, prayers and your proceeds and your support of the ministry. I love you. My wife and I, our family, we love you. And thank you for allowing us to be a part of your Bible study. Okay.